Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. Today's topic, we'll be looking at the NOMS report on calf and heifers. Our learning objectives will be to look at practices used on U.S. dairy farms in 2013 and was summarized in 2014 by NOMS. It will identify the impact of herd size and ad adaptation of various practices and technology and certainly determine which practices may have major impacts on U.S. dairy farms. NOM stands for the National Animal Health Monitoring System. This is sponsored by USDA, and about every three to five years, they will track various dairy practices in the United States. In this last survey, dairy farms in 17 states were visited, and data and, in some cases, samples were collected, which will represent about 77% of the U.S. operations and about 80% of the cows in the United States. A series of graphs have been listed for your review. Several of these graphs will be used later in other parts of programs. Uh, most of the PowerPoints reflect uh, herd operations, uh, not the total cows. That is also available, but due to size and just the length of this program, we elected just to stay with dairy operations. If you want to study a complete copy of the NOMS report, you can go to the website listed here below. Let's take a quick overview of the data. The rolling herd average, remember this is 2013 data, 19,932 pounds of milk. The average age of first calving was 25 months. That's a bit long. Average days dry, very typical, 57 days. Calving interval, 13.1 months, pretty typical as well. Interesting, about 90% of the farms had Holstein cows, of which 86% of all the cows in the survey were Holsteins. Interesting, 30% of the farms had Jersey cows, but they only represent 8% of all the cows that were on these farms. 12.6% of the dairy cows were registered. 46% of the herds had completed a quality assurance programs, primarily the FARM, F-A-R-M program. And interestingly, 10% of the farms used RBST, of which 15% of all the cows were injected with RBST to stimulate milk production. You'll see it broken down into several broad categories. We'll go through this very quickly. And the first one is calving area. This first one looks at area used for calving. You can see that individual pens are at overall at 28.6%. The format on all these crafts are much the same. You'll break them down by small, medium, and large sizes, and then overall. I've highlighted one red area on each one of these that kind of caught my attention. So in this case here, you can see that only about 28% of the farms are actually cleaning individual pens, in my view, an opportunity for improvement. The next one is testing cows for Yoni's disease. A bit surprising to me, 74% of the respondents said they were testing cows for Yoni's disease. I expect that number might be a little bit lower than that, but that's a very impressive number. The next one looked at length of time cows were in the usual calving pen area before calving. You can see at a time of less than one day, about 42%. The well, reason this is interesting is because just in time calving means you move the cow the day of the calf being born. Kind of reflects some of that technology. The next one looks at time the cow spends with the calf after calving here. You can see less than uh, a quarter of an hour and you know, about 10% of the farms doing this. We like to get them separated to avoid exposing the calf to diseases and take control of colostrum intake. Our next area is births and stillborns. We look at this uh, slide looking at calves born dead and alive. This is really good news. 94% uh, of the calves are born and were still alive in the first 48 hours. Historically, that number has been closer to 91%. Uh, so we see some nice improvement here. Probably reflects monitoring these animals at calving. The next one looks when the calf was separated from their dams. And I highlighted two areas. You can see less than one hour. And you can see about 10% of the calves are separated. Again, meaning that we're not we're going to reduce the exposure of the calf to the environment, to the cow, to any manure that may be on the teat itself, and take better control of colostrum intake here. And now that number is quite low. I would like hope to see a much higher number there to separate it even sooner. Another area in the report is colostrum management. And we look at calves getting colostrum in the first feeding. You can see here in number of hours, 3.6 hours. Pretty good number. Notice there's not much trend difference between small, medium, and large. 
although the large herds get there a little bit sooner, that's because they probably have a dedicated staff person to do that. Uh, we'd like to see that less than six hours to avoid closure in terms of colostrum antibody absorption. The next chart looks at methods to feed heifer calves colostrum and hand feeding. You can see that about 53% of the people were hand feeding only, uh, removing it, not depending on the dam to provide some of the colostrum here. The good news is uh, that number is quite low, less than 5%. We're expecting the calf and the cow to get it right in the first feeding. The next one, look at the source of colostrum. You can see the one I highlighted, which scares me a little bit, is pool colostrum, unpasteurized, that's 16%. So any cow that would have yonis or have any kind of a, a disease transmission going through the milk, be it from the dam herself or like staph or step or mycoplasma or uh, E. coli, uh, there's a risk. So we're just basically expanding our risk. A notice only 3% were pasteurizing pool colostrum that would make it much, much safer. The next one looks at methods used to give the newborn heifer calf their first feeding of colostrum. And you can see uh, 8% were using esophageal feeder. The most popular one is bottle, of course. The esophageal feeder means now you can get in your three quarts or four quarts, depending on the amount you want to administer to the calf. A little bit more total control of the volume without a lot of fighting. The next one looks at the volume of colostrum normally fed to calves in the first 24 hours. You can see, surprisingly, four quarts in the first feeding, only about 22% were doing this. The guideline you'll see is typically a one gallon for Holstein calves, about three quarts for Jersey calves. So certainly opportunities here to get more colostrum, to get more antibodies absorbed by that calf. And then you can look at the subsequent feedings further down the chart. Next, we're going to ask the question, how do you store excess colostrum on the farm? Good news, only 6% were storing without refrigeration. The most popular course is freezing. So certainly that gives us more length of time as well. Next, we look at the estimated colostrum index level using one of the various techniques that are listed there. You can see that 45% of the people look at it. And there's some new research from Illinois that says looking at it won't tell you much because of the effects of beta keratin and yellow color and the viscosity of it as far as that goes. So there's some other better ways to get the job done. Next, we're going to look at how many people were monitoring serum proteins on these calves. We're looking here. You can see the operation and the heifer calves, and you can see a very few operations are doing it. Heifer calves, you can see, is 35%. So the good news is the big operations are really doing it. Therefore, they bias that number up quite a bit. Again, a real opportunity to determine are we having a good cluster management program on the individual dairy farm. Now let's switch to housing. Lots of different ways to house animals. The type of housing used for pre-weaned heifers, you can see individual Hutchins make up about 38% of the total and the most dominant one. And of course, that perhaps is the most recommended one. Weather and temperature and herd size can have impacts on that, but certainly we're pleased to see that number being up at 38%. Lots of other ways to house different calves depending where you live in the U.S. Now let's switch to nutrition. The first one is the type of liquid diet being fed. You can see that 56% were feeding on pasteurized milk. It's very popular. Pasteurized milk, only 7%. And of course, that is the standard recommendation if you're feeding milk to baby calves is to have it pasteurized to kill any pathogens that would be in the milk that may cause health damage and long-term health disadvantages to that heifer calf. What percent of protein in milk replacers? Uh, you can see a large range here. The good news is if you're going to accelerate a calf program, which is going to be around 26 to 28 percent, only about 9.3 percent of the people were at the same level of protein that you would find in Holstein milk on a dry matter basis. The most popular you can see is the 2220. And that's the common jargon. Uh, first 20 is the percent fat. The second 20 is percent protein. So obviously a much lower protein diet going to these calves compared to whole milk. Next, we'll look at the percent fat in milk replacer. Again, you can see the 20% most popular, about 82%. That's kind of the industry standard, uh, the 2020 uh, fat level. If you're looking at Holstein milk, that number would be much closer to 30%. And so the only time you see those higher milk replacers being fed may be Jersey calves and or under winter feeding conditions. Next, we're looking at milk replacer medications. 
you can see that about 40% of the milk replacers had one of these medications in them. This list will change a great deal as we start seeing changes in terms of regulating the use of antibiotics in milk replacer and in calf starters and in dairy farms in general. We can see some ionophores listed there and decoccinate, they would not fall into that category either. Next, we're going to take a look at methods uh, used to feed milk or milk replacer. We can see bottles are the most popular and fairly standard, about 78%, 77% feeding bottles. But we didn't monitor the size of the bottle because there are two-quart, three-quart, and four-quart bottles, which really can have an impact as well. Frequency of uh, milk or milk replacer being fed, I found uh, three-time-a-day feeding would be very helpful for the calf. Very small percents of our people doing that, but the large herds are doing it. 2X is most common, very low percent on 1X, and that is really a good approach. You see some free choice here as well. The amount of milk replacer being fed in terms of a volume here, we have at the eight to nine quarts per animal per day, about 16%. Again, reflecting the aggressive or accelerated calf feeding program. Unfortunately, the, the most popular answer is that four to five quart level for these animals. The primary method used to clean equipment, rinsing and disinfecting after each feeding, you can see 43%. A little disappointed in that. I was hoping that number would be higher than that. But of course, that uh, takes time and additional effort and does add a window of risk in terms of bacterial contamination. Age of heifer, when first offered, we're looking water at 17%, a calf starter basically at uh, 10 days of age, hay and roughages 36 days. Not a big surprise here in terms of these times. They look pretty good. Water might be a bit higher, especially under heat stress conditions and if the calf was suffering a bit from some type of uh, infection. The next one is average age of a weaning. Again, a wide range here. You can see the most popular answer here is 34% uh, at nine weeks. The standard a lot of researchers recommend in research is six to seven weeks. So you'll see the second most popular answer is seven weeks there. Again, opportunities to maybe reduce some of the costs associated with raising heifer calves. Determine when to wean. The number we like to use is the calf starter consumption. And you can see two pounds of calf starter for three consecutive days, 22, 21, 22% we're doing it here. A weaning age, that's the most popular answer, kind of a scary answer. You're saying this calf better eat calf starter or it's just going to stall out. Another area we examined in the report was the weaned and pregnant heifer management program. A very busy slide here looking at different housing types. I didn't highlight anyone broken down in the pre-weaned. We can look at the post-weaned and then, of course, uh, the animal when she's pregnant. And so, obviously, the, uh, the pre-weaned, the winner there we already saw earlier was the individual calf hutch. Next, heifers on pasture. Interesting uh, in terms of uh, pregnant heifers and weaned heifers. Weaned heifers, 58% where I had access to pasture. 74% of the pregnant heifers had access to pasture. This number surprised me. I didn't think it'd be quite that high, but certainly is an advantage in terms of handling feet and legs and letting animals really uh, get some exercise from that aspect as well. However, it does open up the window for, for example, a parasite uh, contamination in worms. Vaccination, other preventative programs. Another big laundry list of different types of products being used here. You can see that for any of the diseases, about half the respondents were using one or more of these products and uh, don't have a good feel on uh, which ones should be most popular. Uh, the first four are some of the respiratory ones. The next couple uh, will fall into the scouring area as well. So again, you can study the numbers here. To me, an obvious trend in terms of herd size, the larger herds being much more proactive in terms of of vaccination programs in 2013. The next area we'll look at is the vaccinated uh, weaned heifers. Again, a whole list of different products there, and I've highlighted some of the, the more common ones. Once we get past the colostral antibodies, risks as far as that goes, and again, uh, any would be 73%, so certainly a very popular area. 
vaccinating pregnant heifers. Again, those are those same lists. And again, highlighted, again, about half the people are vaccinating pregnant heifers for these various types of diseases on their farms. Vaccination to heifers. Uh, this is an overall chart summarizes some of the earlier ones. Again, broken down into the three H categories, pre-weaned, weaned, and pregnant animals. And again, you can see uh, we start looking at the weaned animals. Uh, that's when the, uh, the animal is not pregnant. You can see a pretty aggressive program coming in most of these areas. Preventative practices, looking at different things to add to the rations in some cases or injected. Pretty interesting list. You can see dewormers. Pretty much matches up with that pasture slide we saw a bit earlier. Rumenzin and Bovatec are on a force. I was disappointed to see only 52% reported of that. We can see the injectables, probably in the younger animals at that point, injectable selenium or feed additive, 59%. That's disappointing to me. In most parts of the United States, we should be adding selenium either to the diet or injecting the animals as well. The other number that's interesting is 23% of the farms indicated they were using uh, probiotics. These are live microbes. And uh, across the board, you can see pretty good use on that one, a bit higher than I expected to see. Overall, 94% uh, of the farms reported using one or more of these products. Next, testing calves for BVD. You can see 22% of the heifer calves were being tested for BVD. That's surprisingly low. The good news is the larger farms, you can see a third of them are much more aggressive looking for these sentinel heifers that can really cause problems in the heifer facility and in the cow areas as well. Tested methods uh, for this BVD testing, the ear notch is the most common and recommended one. You can see about half the farms were using that approach. And again, the large farms, you can see very aggressive on this. They didn't want uh, any of the risk animals associated in their herds. So what's our take-home message? We covered a lot of information here quickly, some guidelines, some interpretation. What we want to know and certainly is that we saw that in some cases herd size was a major factor in terms of adaptation of the recommended practices. Uh, number two, there are opportunities for improvement. On here, you heard that in some of my comments uh, as we went through this, some real opportunities in some areas. We've made some real progress, which leads to our third take-home message, and now we have a database that we can come back maybe five years from now and ask some of those same questions to say, how has the industry changed and what impact has our educational programs had? Well, thanks. Have a great day.